In English, the first three words in the Holy Scriptures are, in the beginning. But these words are translated from a single Hebrew word that is pronounced barashit. And this prepositional statement about time sets the stage for the creation of the heavens and the earth. But because God is the one who created the heavens and the earth and all that is in them, in the beginning, the second and third Hebrew words of the Bible mean God created. So, when we put all of these words together, we get the very first sentence of Scripture that states, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And this profound statement actually describes the beginning of time as we know it, the beginning of the heavens as we know them, and the beginning of the earth as we know it. But the God of the Bible, who created time, space, matter, and energy, obviously existed before the beginning, as the uncaused cause of all things. And from his all-knowing, eternally existing viewpoint, God describes in the very first chapter of the very first book of His Holy Word how from the very beginning, time functioned in the same way it functions today. From the beginning, God describes countable days that contain a single evening and a single morning. And by numbering days one through six, by their evenings and mornings, the Holy Scriptures describe the creation of everything we can see within the world we live in, except for death, decay, pain, suffering, and sin. But God did not only describe His creating of all things in six standard days in the first chapter of Genesis. No, Later, Scripture records a time when God Himself descended to earth in smoke and fire, and that awesome day was witnessed by somewhere around two million people, and their descendants still exist as a nation even today. The divinely appointed leader of that great crowd wrote about the day God descended to the earth in the second book of the Bible. He writes, Now Mount Sinai was completely in smoke, because the Lord descended upon it in fire. Its smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mountain quaked greatly. And when the blast of the trumpet sounded long, and became louder and louder, Moses spoke, and God answered him by voice. And while millions of people listened, God said, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work. You, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Yes, the first book of the Bible called Genesis reveals that God created the heavens, the earth, the sea, and all that is in them in six standard days and rested on the seventh day. And God himself confirmed that precise chronological account when he announced his Ten Commandments from the top of Mount Sinai. So we can see that from the beginning, on the very first seventh day, the Sabbath existed. And God himself rested 
or more literally, Sabbathed, on the seventh day. And the seventh day was the very first holy thing our God created, according to the book of Genesis. Thus, because God sanctified the seventh day, or made it holy from the very beginning, the fourth commandment begins by pointing back to that very first seventh day with the word, remember. God has said that it is wrong to worship any other gods. It is wrong to bow down to graven images. It is wrong to take his name in vain. It is wrong to dishonor our parents. It is wrong to murder. It is wrong to commit adultery. It is wrong to steal. It is wrong to bear false witness. And it is wrong to covet. But our God has also said that it is wrong to forget his Sabbath. And he made it clear that it is a sin to not set apart the seventh day as holy. In fact, our Creator instituted the death penalty for all those who would violate His fourth commandment by working on the seventh day. And more than any other commandment, since the dawn of creation, the fourth commandment of the Decalogue has been forever intertwined with how we are to track the passing of time. In fact, the seven-day week is established by the fourth commandment and the holy days of firstfruits and Pentecost can only be accurately identified by those who observe the Sabbath commandment. Truly, time is measured by movement and we measure days by the movement of the sun in the sky. And, in a very similar way, we measure months by the varying illuminations of the moon. But weeks are measured by numbering each day as God numbered the days in Genesis and resetting the week after each and every holy seventh day Sabbath. But each week when we keep the seventh day holy by resting on the same day of the week that our Creator rested, we remind ourselves that He made every good thing that we enjoy, including the Sabbath, in the beginning. And He even provided a very special day of rest for His creation in a perfect world before sin, death, and suffering entered in. Then, as time progressed into the second book of the Bible called Exodus, God reminded the Israelites about His Sabbath when He gave them manna from heaven for six days, but not on the seventh day. And shortly after that reminder, He issued the fourth commandment and wrote the words of His covenant down on two tablets of stone. But in the fourth book of the Bible, called Numbers, the first case of someone receiving the death penalty for working on the Sabbath is recorded. And God himself told Moses to have all the congregation stone a man to death for gathering sticks on the Sabbath day. But this most serious of punishments, did not ultimately prevent future generations of the descendants of Israel from profaning God's holy Sabbath day. Because in the time of the prophet Jeremiah, God warned and ultimately punished Judah for ignoring his Sabbath day. And the captivity of Judah was at least partially caused by them working on the seventh day of the week. However, once again, this terrible 70-year-long punishment did not cause the children of Israel to remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And Nehemiah records that he found people profaning the Sabbath day shortly after they had returned to the Promised Land. Thus, the Bible clearly records that 
throughout the ages, many generations of God's people have sinned by working on the seventh day of the week. But Scripture also records that there were times that people sinned against God's Sabbath day in very different ways as well. In Isaiah, it is written, Bring no more futile sacrifices. Incense is an abomination to me. The new moons, the Sabbaths, and the calling of assemblies. I cannot endure iniquity and the sacred meeting. Your new moons and your appointed feasts my soul hates. They are a trouble to me. I am weary of bearing them. Many false teachers have tried to incorrectly use this passage to say that God was abolishing his Sabbaths and his feast days. But the truth is that our God said this because the people were committing every kind of sin while still observing his Sabbath and his feasts. So God told them, Cease to do evil, learn to do good, Seek justice, rebuke the oppressor, defend the fatherless, and plead for the widow. And later, through the same prophet, God said, Blessed is the man who does this, and the son of man who lays hold on it, who keeps from defiling the Sabbath, and keeps his hand from doing any evil. Therefore, a person can sin by working on the Sabbath day, and they can also defile the Sabbath by observing it while they practice lawlessness in every other area of their life. And it was because of the second type of Sabbath defilement that the Lord told the people, I cannot endure iniquity and the sacred meeting. But Isaiah had even more to say about the Sabbath in the final chapter of the book that bears his name. And in that chapter, before the Sabbath is mentioned, it is written, For behold, the Lord will come with fire and with his chariots like a whirlwind, to render his anger with fury and his rebuke with flames of fire. For by fire and by his sword the Lord will judge all flesh, and the slain of the Lord shall be many. When will the Lord come with fire like a whirlwind to render his anger with fury? When will the fire and the sword of the Lord judge all flesh? Obviously, this passage is describing the day of the Lord, the battle of Armageddon, in a time that is still in the future. And it's important that we note this, because this passage sets the chronological context for the following inspired words of Holy Scripture. Shortly after that pronouncement, in the same final chapter of Isaiah, it is written, And it shall come to pass, that from one new moon to another, and from one Sabbath to another, all flesh shall come to worship before me, says the Lord. And they shall go forth, and look upon the corpses of the men who have transgressed against me. For their worm does not die, and their fire is not quenched. They shall be an abhorrence, to all flesh. In these final words recorded by the prophet Isaiah, it is revealed that after Jesus returns and establishes his glorious throne in Jerusalem, all flesh will keep the new moons and the Sabbaths that Jesus instituted. So time will still be kept in the future, just as it was once kept in Israel in the first century, when our Lord walked the earth with his disciples. And during the millennial reign of Jesus Christ our King, 
all flesh will observe his holy Sabbath day. But Isaiah was not the only holy prophet to reveal that the Sabbath will continue after the Lord returns to the earth. No, Ezekiel reveals the same thing when we study his writings carefully and recognize the time frame of the things he is describing. For example, in Ezekiel chapter 40, while the prophet is still in captivity in Babylon, in the spirit he was shown a great temple in a rebuilt city of Jerusalem. But Jerusalem was still in ruins at the time Ezekiel saw this vision. And we should also note that the description of the temple Ezekiel saw does not fit with any historical descriptions of the temple, even the one that was rebuilt after the Babylonian captivity. So, from chapter 40 onward, in the book of Ezekiel, the temple being described seems to be a still yet to be built future temple in the city of Jerusalem. And this conclusion is confirmed by something else the prophet described about that amazing temple. In chapter 43, after describing in exquisite detail this future temple of God, Ezekiel wrote, Afterward, he brought me to the gate, the gate that faces toward the east. And behold, the glory of the God of Israel came from the way of the east, his voice was like the sound of many waters, and the earth shone with his glory. And the glory of the Lord came into the temple by the way of the gate which faces toward the east. Because of this prophecy about the glory of the God of Israel coming to the temple mount from the east, the Jews bury their dead on the Mount of Olives to the east of the temple in expectation of the Lord's return. And because of this same prophecy, the Muslims have placed a cemetery in front of the eastern gate that they also keep sealed shut to prevent Jesus from entering the Temple Mount according to this prophecy. So. Many scholars, from many different points of view, clearly believe that the events described after Ezekiel chapter 40 are future events. And the Muslim cemetery in front of the Eastern Gate, along with the Jewish cemetery facing that same gate on the Mount of Olives, proves that the world still expects Ezekiel chapter 43 to take place in the future. And they are most certainly correct in this belief, because Ezekiel also recorded, The Spirit lifted me up and brought me into the inner court, and behold, the glory of the Lord filled the temple. Then I heard him speaking to me from the temple while a man stood beside me. And he said to me, Son of man, this is the place of my throne and the place of the soles of my feet where I will dwell in the midst of the children of Israel forever. Therefore, since no temple that has yet been built in Jerusalem has ever been filled with the glory of the Lord forever, this is most certainly a prophecy that must be fulfilled after Jesus Christ returns to the earth. And most premillennial scholars believe that this temple will be built at the beginning of the millennium when Jesus and his resurrected saints will rule over all the earth for 1,000 years. So with that temporal context in mind, it's very telling when Ezekiel writes about this same temple, Thus says the Lord God, The gateway of the inner court that faces towards the east shall be shut 
the six working days. But on the Sabbath it shall be opened, and on the day of the new moons it shall be opened. Likewise the people of the land shall worship at the entrance to this gateway before the Lord, on the Sabbaths and on the new moons. In a temple that has not yet been built, that most scholars agree will be built in the future, the operations of that temple will be governed by the new moons and the Sabbaths. And on the Sabbaths and the new moons, all flesh will worship the Lord of hosts in the city of Jerusalem. And the prophets could not be any clearer about this fact. But Ezekiel and Isaiah were not the only holy men of God to declare that the Sabbath would exist after the time of the Lord's return. No, friends, Jesus our Lord himself also indicated that the Sabbath would still be around even before he came back, and he said this in the portion of Scripture we call the Olivet Discourse. In a command to his disciples who had asked him, what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Jesus said, Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains and pray that your flight may not be in winter or on the Sabbath. Brothers and sisters, Daniel describes the abomination of desolation by saying, Then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week, but in the middle of the week he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. And on the wing of abominations shall be one who makes desolate even until the consummation, which is determined, is poured out on the desolate. The word translators have rendered here as weak is Shabua, and it literally means a period of seven. But based on the context of the passages before this one in this chapter, when the angel speaking to Daniel uses this word, it does not mean a period of seven days. Instead, it means a period of seven years. So Gabriel told Daniel that a man will confirm a covenant with many for one seven-year-long period. But in the middle of that seven-year-long period, he will bring an end to sacrifice and offering while he will also somehow bring desolation to the earth by setting up an abomination. And Paul writes about this terrible time in the future by saying, Now brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit, or by word, or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come, unless the falling away comes first, and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Before the coming of Jesus and our gathering together to him, a falling away must happen first, along with the abomination of desolation described by Daniel. And Paul explains that the abomination of desolation will involve a man referred to as the man of sin or the man of lawlessness revealing himself to the world. And this evil man 
that John calls the Antichrist will reveal himself by putting an end to sacrifice and offering while he opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped so that he sits as God in the temple of God showing himself that he is God. Thus, based on Daniel chapter 9 and Daniel chapter 12, we can say that this abomination of desolation will occur approximately three and a half years before Jesus returns to destroy the Antichrist with the brightness of his coming. But Jesus said about that moment, Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who is on the housetop not go down to take anything out of his house, and let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. But woe to those who are pregnant, and to those who are nursing babies in those days, and pray that your flight may not be in winter or on the Sabbath. For then there shall be great tribulation, such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor ever shall be. When did Jesus tell his disciples that they should quickly flee from Jerusalem without pausing for any reason? When they saw the abomination of desolation that would take place in the middle of a period of seven years, just three and a half years before he returned. And why? Did Jesus say that they should pray that their flight may not be in winter or on the Sabbath? Well, because during both of those times, it is more difficult to travel, just as it is more difficult to travel when pregnant or when nursing babies. Obviously, cold and icy winter weather can hinder travel, and slow down a person who's trying to quickly escape a time of great tribulation. But how can the Sabbath hinder travel and slow down a person who's trying to escape? Well, if you were in Jerusalem on a high Sabbath, such as a feast day, since every male descendant of Jacob was commanded to be there at that time, the crowds would most certainly slow down your escape. But even if Jesus was only speaking about a weekly Sabbath, there are several issues that would hinder a person from quickly fleeing from Jerusalem. And the first issue would be that all Sabbath observers would have gathered at the synagogue on the Sabbath day, just as our Savior and his apostles and disciples did. So it's easy to imagine that they might not hear news about an abomination of desolation if they were all meeting together in their local synagogue. Also, since Sabbath observance requires people to cease from their customary work and give their animals rest, on the Sabbath, animals would not be bridled or saddled for a quick escape to the mountains. And these facts would have a direct impact on how quickly a person could escape on the Sabbath until the relatively recent invention of the motor vehicle. But even with motor vehicles, since many in Judea still observe the Sabbath, most of Jerusalem shuts down on the seventh day of the week. And about this reality, TouristIsrael.com explains, Starting from early on Friday afternoon, businesses, shops, and most restaurants begin to close up. Some non-kosher restaurants remain open during Shabbat, as do a very limited number of businesses in the west of the city. And they also explain 
public transportation, buses and light railway, do not run at all in Jerusalem during Shabbat, and services end in the hours leading up to sunset. Shared taxis and private taxis do continue to operate. So, you see, observing the Sabbath naturally causes some logistical issues for those who are fleeing for their lives from Jerusalem after seeing the abomination of desolation in the holy place. And just like winter, a lack of public transportation would slow down a modern person just as unprepared livestock would slow down our Lord's disciples in the past. But now that we understand how the Sabbath can impact travel, and why Jesus said that those in Judea should pray that their flight would not occur in the winter or on the Sabbath, we must recognize that Jesus expected the Sabbath to still be a factor a few years before his return. So, we have read together how the Sabbath was made in the beginning. We have read together about how the Sabbath will still be observed after Jesus returns. And we have even read together about how Jesus expected the Sabbath to still be observed just before his second coming. But now, let's remind ourselves of how the Sabbath was observed during the first century by the Lord's closest disciples, and later by the churches his apostles established. After discussing how it was the Lord's custom to attend the synagogue each Sabbath, Luke later records the women who had come with him from Galilee followed after, and they observed the tomb and how his body was laid. Then they returned and prepared spices and fragrant oils, and they rested on the Sabbath according to the commandment. The women who had been with Jesus since his ministry on earth began saw how his crucified body was laid in the tomb. They returned to the place they were staying and prepared spices and fragrant oils to anoint the Messiah's precious remains. And then, after spending three years with Jesus and hearing everything Jesus ever said about the Sabbath day, those women rested on the Sabbath day according to the fourth commandment. And the same companion of the Apostle Paul who wrote the Gospel of Luke later recorded, Paul reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath, and persuaded both Jews and Greeks. So Paul never taught against or abandoned God's Sabbath day. In fact, when we look at the actual Greek texts of the two passages most often quoted to support weekly Sunday church meetings, we see that the Sabbath, not Sunday, is mentioned. For example, to justify Sunday worship, many will turn to Acts chapter 20 and read verse 7 from their erroneous English translations that say, Now, on the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul, ready to depart the next day, spoke to them and continued his message until midnight. But friends, I can assure you today that Luke wrote no such thing. No, if Luke were to learn English and read that translation, friends, he would tear it up. Because what Luke really wrote was, And on one of the Sabbaths, the disciples, having been gathered to break bread, Paul reasoned with them being about to exit the next day, and he extended the word until midnight. You see, the first passage deceived teachers typically quote to attempt to justify weekly Sunday worship 
actually mentions the Sabbath by name. And Luke clearly identified the day the disciples met together by its relationship to the Sabbath day. In fact, Luke was referring to the annual holy day of first fruits when Jesus rose from the dead as the first fruits of the resurrection. And we can prove this is true by simply reminding others how in Leviticus the Lord instructed us to count 50 days from the day after the Sabbath when the priest would bring the wave offering of the first fruits before the Lord to the day after the seventh Sabbath that we also know as Pentecost. And then, after we have shown someone that reality in the book of Leviticus, we can turn back to Acts 20 in a literal English translation that uses the words one and Sabbath, like Luke did. And with that literal translation, we can then show them how the disciples were meeting on day one in the count to 50. And then we can show them that verse 16 states, For Paul had decided to sail past Ephesus so that he would not have to spend time in Asia, for he was hurrying to be at Jerusalem, if possible, on the day of Pentecost, or on the 50th day. So Paul met with the disciples in Troas on the day of first fruits, or day one, in the annual counting of seven Sabbaths. And we can prove that this was the day they met, because Luke mentions... He was hurrying in his travels from Troas to make it to Jerusalem in time for Pentecost, or the 50th day. And once we have explained this simple biblical chronological framework to someone from Acts chapter 20, we can then show them how Paul used the exact same wording as Luke in the Greek in 1 Corinthians chapter 16. Yes, the second badly mistranslated passage that deceived teachers will quote to try to prove that the disciples met each week on Sunday is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 16. And just like Luke, Paul would tear his clothes and destroy a modern English translation of his words in that passage because instead of endorsing a perpetual violation of the fourth commandment. Our brother Paul was really writing about the same annual holy day that Luke was. In most erroneous modern English translations, we're told that Paul wrote something like, On the first day of the week, let each one of you lay something aside, storing up as he may prosper, that there be no collections when I come. But friends, the truth is, Paul actually wrote, Towards one of the Sabbaths, let each one of you lay beside himself, storing up as he may prosper, that there be no collections when I come. And just as we saw in Acts chapter 20, Pentecost, or the 50th day, is mentioned shortly after this reference to day one in the count to the 50th day. Therefore, Paul wanted each of them to set aside as they had prospered, as the day of first fruits or one of the Sabbaths, approached, because that would be obedient to God's instructions for the holy day of first fruits. Yes, God had instructed that on day one, in the count to fifty, or Pentecost, his people were to bring the first fruits of their harvest to the priest, for him to present it as a wave offering before the Lord. So Paul wanted them to take up an annual first fruits offering to be taken to the oppressed saints in Jerusalem. 
and this was perfectly consistent with the Lord's instructions about the holy day of first fruits. Because in this same letter, Paul taught that the saints were now the temple of the Holy Spirit. So we can see that not one verse of the Holy Bible actually contradicts God's fourth commandment. And even the mistranslated passages that deceived teachers have relied on to justify their deviations from God's holy seventh day actually mention the Sabbath by name. Therefore the scriptures have, throughout all time, been very consistent about the seventh day Sabbath from the very first Hebrew word of Genesis to the very last Greek word of Revelation.